Hello everybody and welcome back to Rebellious Menstruation and another bloody tale about the misconceptions of about the history of periods. There seems to be Hi everyone, just doing a little bit of a kind of pre-warning for this video. I filmed it quite a while ago. Um, I really wasn't happy with the results of this video. I wasn't, I do get kind of very ranty in it, which is fine. Um, but because I get, I got so frustrated with it, I just wasn't happen, happy with where I kind of went with the conclusions and always had kind of felt that I could do a better job with this video. Um, but of course, what frustrated me about it the first time has also frustrated me um, ongoing. So it's been an ongoing frustration with this video. So I have, uh, of course, just got super frustrated with it. But um, in spite of how I feel quite dodgy about this, I will um, be posting it anyway so you will see this next up is the video uh, regarding how historical inaccuracies have happened in period care thanks hello everybody and welcome back to rebellious menstruation and another bloody tale about the misconception about the history of periods. There seems to be uh, these serious historical misconceptions, such as the idea that cave women went about the place with blood running down their thighs or their legs like it ain't no thing. If you've looked up the history of tampons, I think uh, I'll link it up here on the left if you want to see it, or the history of what women used to do, you'll find a plethora of increasingly absurd theories like the aforementioned running around with no protection on. There are also other assumptions such as periods being lighter and or only enough to smear the thighs rather than run down the legs or that these women spent most of the time pregnant, miscarrying or breastfeeding to suppress menstruation. However, there was literally no evidence to support that this happened. Aside from current medical evidence to support breastfeeding um, can actually delay ovulation or periods post-birth. It can act, this is actually specific to each individual. Therefore, a 12 to 18 month breastfeeding gap is not actually accurate. Otherwise, we wouldn't get kids that are 12 months apart or I know, I literally know people who are 10 months apart from their siblings. So they've been born in the same calendar year. So if we, if you're, if you're breastfeeding suppressed your ovulation for 12 to 18 months, most kids would be two to three years apart. We know that this is not accurate. And so your specific body requirements will generally dictate how, you know, fertile you are or how quickly you can become pregnant or if breastfeeding in fact reduces your ability to get pregnant at all. In addition, there are no indications that um, there are indications that women did not start having children until they were approximately 19 or 20. Um, and they quite often had their first kid around 1920, their second kid about two years yet later, and their third kid about two years after that. There are indications that some women had eight to ten children, but there are also other indications that they had between three and four children. So you know, this whole mythology surrounding women have women having a plethora of children is also massively inaccurate. Also, um, there is a massive kind of mathematical issue that comes up a lot. While the average age may be written down as 25 or 30, this number is severely, severely skewed by the infant mortality rate. If you made it past 15 years old, you had a great chance of surviving till 50 plus, up until your 60s. And, you know, there is anthropological evidence of people in their 60s that survive, that exist now. If you're a woman, you would survive past 15 and then survived your childbearing years. Um, there, again, there is a great indication was a great there is a great chance that you'll survive into your 50s and 60s 
But again, the infant mortality rate severely skews, skews these responses because most of the deaths that would happen that were unexplained, i.e. outside of war, were with infants under five. While anthropology is a continually developing field as we get further and further information, if you look up medieval women and menstruation and find something that says, women just bled into their clothes, rest assured you found something written by a man who had no fucking idea how periods work. In addition, periods are shamed today. People are embarrassed by their periods today. This is 2021 and people are still fucking embarrassed by them. Men still have no idea. I have seen comments by men that are terrifyingly ignorant because they have never been told, explained about periods. Why would you think that the people writing the history books or the people recording the history over the last thousand couple of thousand years would have any idea about a women's issue about because their wives and their daughters would not have told them about it and would not be discussing them about it because they don't discuss it with them today the fact that people are still perpetuation perpetuating these bad historical inaccuracies including women that write on the subject who should really know better is completely and utterly ridiculous Basically, there are sources out there that would indicate that this is not the case. We do have archaeological evidence for what they used. We don't have many written documents, but we also do have written documents. The indication that women wore red petticoats, I think I have addressed this before in another video, but if you've actually ever bled onto black, onto red cloth or red clothing your blood stain shows up the only color that you would be wearing would be black because black is the only one that it would sh still show uh like a uh the like the wet stain but it would not show the blood stain red petticoats show blood stains if you don't believe me get me red on bleed on it and it will show you that red petticoats are literally not the best things to wear in these situations Quite often wool, um, it was suggested to be using, uh, you know, soaking up blood, but wool is actually itchy and it also repels moisture. Like if you, wool is actually a moisture repellent. There is evidence for underwear like garments made of seal skin with blood moss remnants. One is waterproof, the other is super absorbent so that it can be rinsed out, wrung out, rinsed with blood and wrung out. Another kind of thing that is uh, indicated a lot is that for a lot of time people didn't wear essentially what we would classify as underwear or at least in modern underwear. So for a long time people didn't wear underwear but people did wear garments that covered themselves up and people would wear garments. They did dress battle wounds and they would dress to essentially women would utilize things to actually deal with their period to think that they wouldn't is based on the fact that people didn't necessarily always wear underwear is a really ridiculous thing we know the type of things that were used um, like the seal skin and blood moss remnants because while there isn't much of anything written down regarding the use of blood moss for periods scribes wax poetic about it using battle wounds and surgeries an archaeologist discussed that the seal skin find thought it was an incontinence garbage, uh, garment considering the age of the skeleton it was found attached to. But if these garments existed, it wasn't really a stretch to suggest that these are actually used for periods and not for incontinence. The design would have essentially been exactly what would have been used to address your periods. using the skill, seal skin outer you would have also could also place cotton into the inner lining to absorb the blood be rinsed out and used again a greek historian wrote that a woman so enraged her suitor who wouldn't leave her be that she removed her blood soaked cloth pad and flung it into his face um which sounds fucking hilarious um 
plenty of course wrote that women were poison on their periods and shouldn't be allowed anywhere outside of their home when on their courses but he was a raving misogynist even by roman standards unfortunately a lot of modern people obviously love Pliny. medieval churches preached that women were unclean useless and suffering from eve's sin so of course they should be kept away from church and away from fields and livestock unless that uncleanliness and um, contaminate anything or everything and send everybody insane However, landowners with planted fields literally gave no fucks about the church's claims because they needed help, male and female, bleeding or not. Women needed the money and they could earn this by doing various tasks, bleeding or not. So bleeding out onto your clothes or bleeding down your legs would not have been conducive in any place in society because you would need to function in that society and it would not have been in any way you would not have been in any way able to live in public while you were covered in your own blood. So, <laughs> there is also an indication that medieval women who were in convents were considered holy in comparison to their non-convert brethren, brethren uh, because they tended to no longer have periods or suffering Eve's sin. Um, but however, as we all know, with restrictive diets, what would have happened in a convent is that they would have lived an austere lifestyle, which means they would have had a strict diet. And when you have a strict or severe diet and almost no body fat, you will lose your period. The moment these women left the convent and started eating normal, healthy food, it is almost as if it fixed what was happening and they got their periods back thus proving you know that your diet is massively influential in your with your period however in these times it was actually proof that women you know still had eve sin and all of this other type of ridiculous stuff that even now they still spout but even back in these medieval times uh, medical practices still actually meant that they knew better they knew that diets actually were how they affected body fat and women's periods so there is evidence that from you know medical practitioners of the time that they would tell women who were struggling to have regular menstrual cycles to eat rich food and drink this information and these types of information just go to show how bad our historical records of periods are and how much information we still lack and know and why such ridiculous perhaps ridiculous propositions such as oh they just bled minor amounts and they only had four periods over their lifetime because they were either pregnant or breastfeeding or they just bled onto their clothes Do you know how impractical it is to bleed out everywhere when you were working or when you were out in the fields or when you were hunting or when you are doing anything that would involve not just sitting alone being buried in dirt this ridiculous preposition is also based on the fact that or on the ideology that women didn't do anything that women sat around in their mansions and had maids to do everything for them the majority of people and the majority of people in history did not live wealthy lifestyles they lived working lifestyles on a farm having um, if you're a married couple on that farm it is impractical to assume that one half of the adult people on that farm wouldn't have been doing any fucking work so women have always engaged in manual and physical work the unfortunate thing is that most of history is written by people who didn't necessarily have the experiences of women
these pe these women who are or were engaged in manual and physical work had to have had some way of ensuring their period was managed and having period management in place. All of this would suggest that most of the history sources that we have regarding propositions that cave women wandered about bleeding onto themselves but it's okay it wasn't that much or that women bled out onto red petticoats because don't worry it wasn't that much or they must have been pregnant. The historical records that we did have also meant that wealthier women still didn't have 19 or 15 children on the way. The preposition has always been that working class had massive amounts of children and the wealthy had less amounts of children. But that would still mean that all of those women would still need to manage their period. The ridiculousness of all of these things are just so overwhelmingly stupid that it always flummoxes me that is difficult to find reliable and truthful resources when it comes to this. So thank you for watching. As usual, links will be down below. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day no matter where you are in it and I will of course see you all in the next video. Bye everyone. Hello everybody and welcome back to Rebellious Menstruation. Today we're doing a review on the Kindle. Hello everybody and welcome back. Hello everybody and welcome back to Rebellious Menstruation. This is the stash update video for 2021. Um, here is the stack. So let's go through it while we're here. First up is this 11.25 Crowley print, 11.75 sorry, it is by a splendid story. It is cotton lacquer topped, super heavy organic bamboo fleece core and soft shell fleece on the back. There is then this 12.5 inch La Flame from Venus Pads. It is hand dyed OBV topped flannel core and fleece on the back. We've then got this 14 inch honeycomb by Glad Rags. This is all cotton and the inserts at the back here are 7.25 inches. We've then got um, this 15 inch Star Wars print by Go with your flow. And it is cotton topped, cotton terry and flannel core and poly fleece on the back. Um, I think. Oh. Okay, anyway. This, um, the, so this one here is a 13 inch puppet and this one is a 14.25 inch puppet. This is all organic this one here is organic cotton sherpa and this one here is organic cotton sweat shirt knit and they are both cotton flannel and terry core and they are both wind pro fleece on the back um, next up these Hello everybody and welcome back to Rebellious Menstruation. This is an unboxing of um, Earth's Tribe. It should come up there. Hello everybody and welcome back to Rebellious Menstruation. Today we're doing a review on the Kindle. I realise that this may, may be a controversial topic just because it is currently or is owned by Amazon. But we'll get there. 
Kundu was developed in 2007 by Amazon subsidiary Lab126 with codename Fiona. The foundation was the foundation of the Kindle stemmed from a 2004 Jeff Bezos instruction to develop a competitive e-reader. The intention has always been a, uh, been a singular focus on being a reading device over being a multi-purpose device. The first release sold out in five and a half hours and remained that way for five months until April 2008. The online Kindle store was an online and active from November 2007 and by May 2008 Kindle sales represented 6% of Amazon book sales. Over the next several years newer Kindles were released as were newer software technologies like WhisperSync. In 2008 a waterproof Kindle Paperwhite was released in 8GB and 32GB versions. This modern design was thinner and lighter and had sported a glass cover. Kindle 2019, uh, which is kind of like the basic model, I guess, or the, not the basic model, is like the first model. I can't remember the terminology for that, but is their like flagship model, I guess. Is was released in April with four gigabyte of storage before a July 2019 third gen Oasis was released. There are three styles, the Kindle 2019, the Oasis, and the Paperwhite and in four versions because the Paperwhite came in 8 gigabyte and 32 gigabyte. This one here is a paper 32 gig Paperwhite with e-ink and e-ink captive touchscreen. This case uh, I thought looked kind of cozy and kind of cute and this is why I kind of got this uh, case for it. So I had about seven years ago or so a Kobo. Uh, I still, in fact, I still actually have the Kobo app on my phone and access to all the books I had while I had that. But I just did not get in to the whole e-reading at that time. And when my father's e-reader broke, he had a really kind of weird variety, uh, which I don't even remember the name of now. I gave him the one that I had because I didn't actually really use it. So while I carried the Kobo around with me and generally it was in my bag, I didn't actually read from it. I usually had that and a book that I read. <laughs> so, uh, the display, um, this display utilizes e-ink or electronic ink developed in 1997, but based on an idea of lower, low power paper-like displays that have existed since the 1970s. So I'm just gonna go back and then we can have a look at the Screen. This technology is commonly used in e-readers, digital storage, smartwatches, mobile phones, electronic. No, I don't want to do that. I just want to go back. Um, and I will <laughs> deal with that type of shenanigans later. Okay. So... <laughs> I'm not going to deal with basically the cons that I found for the Kindle first. Up, the Kindles are heavily restricted in Australia and the benefits that we will find with Kindles in the USA, such as uh, Prime and Audible benefits, vanish in Australia. While WhisperSync, which is Amazon technology software that keeps Kindle and Audible synced across several devices that you were logged in with so that you can read the book and switch to Audible narration seamlessly or switch between the book on multiple devices seamlessly is available on eligible books. It is not available on the Paperwhite directly so I can't listen to Audible books on my Kindle. On, um, which I think in the US or from what I've read, I believe that you can listen to audible books on your Kindle. So this is like unlike the US device. So this means that I would have to use my mobile device, which is what I just said, which then kind of defeats the Kindle um, and with its battery life bonus, which brings me to my next point. The battery is meant to last approximately six or so weeks. But this is really only if you use it minimally. If you're really into heavy use, it will last far, far less than that. So 
um, say I, use, I can use it say 2.5 to 3 hours a day and it lasts me about 10 days. Maybe it's lasted me less before. Hello everybody and welcome back to Rebellious Menstruation. This is the liner stash update for 2021. These are, there are reviews of these pads in a conveniently assembled playlist which will be linked at the end of this video. These have been organized by essentially the number of pads I have from a particular maker or cloth pad maker. Um, so let's get started shall we. This one here is a 7 inch jaws print by Crimson Cloth Creation cloth topped bamboo fleece core and micro fleece on the back. 7 inch uh, skeleton here by Erin Sweet Sew. Cotton lacquer topped OBV cotton fleece flannel and PUA core and corduroy backed. This uh, octopus is by Novel Red. It is quilters cotton topped, bamboo cotton core, and wind pro on the back. This musical cat is by Tala Cloth. It is cotton topped, cotton terry, and flannel core, and poly fleece on the back. This one here is an 8 inch by Homestead Emporium. It is bamboo velour, um, hand dyed bamboo velour. It is cotton fleece core and water resistant fleece on the back. This is an 8.5 inch TARDIS. It is by Calibre Creations. It is cotton topped, bamboo French terry, cotton flannel and PUA core and micro fleece on the back. This one here is a 9 inch Frida Kahlo by Meteorite Pads. It is woven cotton topped, terry toweling core and woven cotton on the back. This one here is an 8 inch by Bella Luna Inspirations. It is athletic wicking jersey topped bamboo core and fleece on the back. These two here are 8 inches from Hannah Pads in the puppy dog print and the Hannah Blue. Um, these are all organic cotton, um, all internals um, and this back um, backing is TPU um, which is a kind of laminated cotton essentially. Uh, these two here are by Andy Made It. These are cotton flannel topped, bamboo cotton fleece core and anti-pill fleece on the back. These two here are by Daisy and Bird. They are woven cotton topped, bamboo fleece and cotton uh, core and anti-pill wind pro on the back. Uh, these three uh, by the Purple Panda. These two are cotton lycra knit and this is an interesting one and of course I didn't write down that one because that would be Hello everybody and welcome back to Rebellious Menstruation. Today we're looking at a menstrual cup sizing recommendations and why they can be quite frustrating to interpret. Most often menstrual cups are offered in three sizes, teen, size one a, or A or small and size two or B or large. Some companies offer these options in high and low cervix option, uh, offer these in high and low cervix options but there is no standardization. The, standard, the lack of standardization is essentially where the frustration comes in as there um, is not only a standard for what these sizes are called. For example it could be called size 1 or size A or size small and these can also range from like say 32 mils to 45 mils for a small or it could actually range from uh, all the large sizes so the, ru the rubbish dump truck is going past and it is extremely loud but we will continue um, so 
and the large sizes can kind of range from 35 mils to 55 mils. In addition, these rim diameters can vary widely along with the lip shape and firmness. So you can have one company small equating to another company's large or vice versa, you can have a small in one company that equates to, you can have a large in one company that equates to the small cervix option or you can have, there's just so many comparative nightmares that happen within this because there's not a standardization. With tampons, they are usually uh, regulated in Australia by the Therapeutic Goods Administration or TGA and in the USA by the FDA and so they have literal definitions for what a mini uh, regular and a super or maxi actually look like so when you go and buy one of these from separate companies they'll generally fall within or no they won't generally they will fall within the regulated size compatibility whereas there's no such regulation with menstrual cups to say that small is this, regular is this, and super is this. And I mean this, like the Super Jenny's large, is, I think it's a Super Jenny? I think there's another one that may be bigger. It's exceptionally large and so this is very very useful for people with heavy flow but if you've picked a Super Jenny and you're getting the large and it's unexpectedly large, it's not really gonna work out so well because you thought, oh, but I fall into the, you know, large size category, or the B size category, or the size two cup category. And so that's what you've purchased, but it's so much larger than say a large cup that's um, in another company. So, the, I mean, the ones I have in front of us are, this one here is a high cervix cup, this one here, is a size 2 cup and this one here is a size 2 cup and you can see the size variance in all three of them. The issues that this creates is that the over 30 childbirth or the under 30 childless is not the best guideline when selecting a size and is quite arbitrary at worst. Far more significant when choosing a cup is knowing your cervix height whether low, medium or high and using that knowledge to pick an appropriately size of length cup. Measure your cervix by always having clean hands and inserting a finger. You can measure the exact length by removing your finger and measuring where the line is. Or like, you know, you can say, oh, I can feel it. You can indicate on your finger where that was and then measure how long that is. I'm not saying it's necessarily going to be the easiest thing, but you can also go see your OBGYN as well, if that would help you out. and essentially using the height knowledge to pick an appropriately sized length of cup. Measure your cervix by always having clean hands. Always, always, always. I just always have to repeat that because it's insane that people don't clean their hands as much as they should. If you can feel your cervix at all, kind of feels like the tip of your nose. Uh, if you cannot feel that at all, you have a high cervix and you can kind of wear most length of cups. The other options to consider are your pelvic floor muscles and or strength. If you are a super kegel queen and you know your pelvic floor is strong, generally that means you might prefer a smaller cup or have more use with a smaller cup. If you do not have the strongest pelvic floor muscles, then you generally size up with the cups. This is, a, is the genre of childbirth issues or the childbirth that comes, this kind of falls into this category. And in a totally non-judgmental way, the reason this size recommendation is a thing is because your body uh, spends pregnancy prepping for labor. Uh, and please understand that, again, this is not in any way shaming anybody um, because your body, you know, returns to a relatively normal state. Um, and it's not about being loose or anything as ridiculously sexist as that. However, it is related to the strength of your pelvic floor, which is influenced by childbirth. It doesn't necessarily have to be negatively influenced by childbirth, and you can still have a strong pelvic floor. However, again, related to the strength of your pelvic floor, which pregnancy and 
vaginal childbirth can influence. The next consideration is the heaviness of your flow in relation to the capacity of the cup. The more you bleed, the higher capacity you will need or you will need to change more often. So these are three things that you'd need to consider. If you have a light flow yet a high cervix, you may be wary of a shorter or smaller cup as they do because the kind of the, the generally the size of the cups also influences how long they are. So and they can quite often be a substantial size difference. I know with the Yuhi cup, the size difference between one and size one and size two is massive. So size one is uh, like half the size of size two, whereas some cups, there's a marginal difference. You know, you can have size one and size two. If you put them next to each other, you'd barely be able to tell the difference. Again, this is just a lack of regulation in what the sizes can be called. So the size A tends to be, maybe be on the smaller, obviously smaller than size 2. So if you have a light flow and you've purchased a smaller cup, the cup might actually, you know, go a bit higher than you plan to do. They do have a tendency to go quite high and you may do need to do a little bit of fishing around to get it out. It's just an idea that to have. This is actually a quite a um, low capacity cup. This is the Juju High Cervix Cup. Um, this is actually a super firm cup too, so um, this one I, I can't wear on a heavy day, it doesn't have the capacity for me on a heavy day, but it, it's actually quite good for my light days because it sits, um, it sits adequately enough, low enough for me to actually be able to get out. So, I do actually have a review of this uh, Gigi cup here. Um, if you are interested, I will link it up in this left-hand corner for you to see. It is important to understand that choosing a menstrual cup is not as simple as pre or post pregnancy. There are several factors as outlined in this video that are more of a priority to be considered as a whole or at together than just pre or post pregnancy. And really, selling a cup on plea or post-pregnancy is just doing a disservice to new people that have come to the menstrual cup community or people who might not know how many brands or how they differ you know and they might buy a, a cup that isn't suitable for them because they haven't considered all the things that they need to consider and therefore they might go oh menstrual cups are not for me I don't like them and might return to tampons because the information that they have been provided pre or post-pregnancy isn't necessarily the best way or isn't just flat out isn't the best way to actually pick a menstrual cup. I have noticed that several companies have been indicating cup size by light flow or heavy flow uh, so they'll go size A light flow size B heavy flow which is a significant step forward in actually kind of providing that little bit more information however this also neglects cervix, cervix height and pelvic floor strength. So as you can see, the neglect of any of these three considerations can or could lead you to making a choice of menstrual cup that may not normally be right for you. And this could lead you to disliking menstrual cups when in reality it was just, you were just unable to utilize all the information to pick the right menstrual cup for your body's requirements. Thank you for watching. Enjoy your morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are in the day. And I, of course, will catch up with you all in the next video. Bye, everyone. Hello, everybody, and welcome back. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Rebellious Menstruation. Today we're doing a review of the Kindle. I realize that this may be a controversial one because it is owned by Amazon, but we'll get there. Kindle was developed in 2007 by Amazon subsidiary Lab126 with code name Fiona. The foundation of the Kindle stemmed from a 2004 Jeff Bezos instruction to develop a competitive e-reader. At this time there were e-readers on the market. I'm pretty sure it was Sony who had e-readers out or the most popular e-reader out at the time. The intention has 
uh, always been a singular focus on being a reading device over being a multi-purpose device. The first release sold out in five and a half hours and remained sold out um, that way for five months until April 2008. The online Kindle store was established online and active from November 2007. By May 2008, Kindle sales represented 6% of Amazon book sales and over the next few years or several years, Newer Kindles were released as were updated software technologies such as WhisperSync. In 2008, a waterproof Kindle Paperwhite was released in 8GB and 32GB versions. The modern design was thinner, lighter and sported a glass cover. Kindle 2019, which is the baseline model, I guess you would call it, is released in April with four gigabyte of storage before a July 2019 third gen Oasis is released. So uh, the 2019 or Kindle 2019 is the uh, basic version, the Paperwhite is the mid-range version and the Oasis is the top of the line version essentially. And they all come with slightly different specs um, over that and slightly different uh, so it depends on what you want is to the one that you would pick these three styles in four size versions are the well the paper white comes in two sizes I didn't look up the Oasis to be honest with you so I don't know if that comes in multiple sizes um, are the current Kindle Creed this uh, this one here in front of us is the Kindle 32 gig paper white with e-ink captive touch screen. This case I thought looked kind of cozy and kind of cute, uh, so that's why uh, I kind of picked this one, um, and it's worked out perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with this. Um, it's got a couple, a little bit of, you know, where, where I put it up and down, but there's literally nothing wrong with it. I have dropped it a couple of times and had no issue with this cover on my Kindle. So I had about seven or so years ago had a Kobo. In fact, I still have the Kobo app on my phone and access to the books I had while I had that Kobo. In fact, um, I just did not get down with the whole e-reader situation at that time. Um, when my father's e-reader broke, I gave him, you know, the Kobo that I didn't really use, even though I kind of carried it around with me and it was generally in my bag. I just didn't find that I used the e-reader. There's nothing wrong with the Kobo. Um, but he had like a no-name brand variety of e-reader and I think it had a, a couple of years but then obviously at some point it had broken and I was like oh here have mine <laughs> so that's kind of what happened with the Kobo and to be fair they used it all the time um, my father and his wife um, I think they had two e-readers one each um, even though they probably shared it they said that they just had different books on both of the uh, e-readers that they had um, and they're like, oh, we could just use one. And I was like, well, yeah, you could, but I don't use mine and you guys use them all the time. So here. And it was because it was already preloaded with all the books I had. There was probably a significant amount of books um, that they didn't, ha that they hadn't put on theirs. So it just gave them access to a different um, range of books. And keeping the Kobo was just kind of a waste of it for me. So because I didn't use it. Um, I got this one last year year before last, but I think the start of 2020, I got this. Um, and it was because I was kind of um, planning <laughs> to do some travel. So I had four or five months of travel set up for 2020. I think we all know by now what happened to that. Um, so, but it, it, irrelevant of uh, why that did not happen, I had prepped by uh, getting an e-reader so that I didn't obviously take around books with me. But prior to that, 
most of the books that I had, I had a couple of big picture books um, that I usually bought new, but I was a very big secondhand bookstore slash op shop books buyer. Um, so most of the books that I had purchased and read and done all that type of stuff with were from secondhand stores and thrift stores. So I didn't necessarily always buy new books. Probably the most new books that I'd bought were either graphic novels or coffee table books. So, back to this. The display utilizes e-ink or electronic ink developed in 1997 but based on the idea of low power paper like displays that or the ideology around this has existed since the 1970s. The technology, the e-ink technology is commonly used in e-readers, digital signage, smartwatches, mobile phones, electronic shelf labels and architecture panels. I am now going to deal with the cons that I found um, with the Kindle first up. So uh, first, the Kindle is heavily restricted in Australia. So the benefits that you will find in the USA, such as Prime and Audible benefits, vanish in Australia. So we do have Prime and Audible here. But uh, from what I can gather in the US versions of the Kindle, you can actually listen to Audible narration on your Kindle device. That And the Kindle device in the US also has a Bluetooth technology to obviously listen to your ebook or, or, or to your um, audio book. And you can also like, you know, have, the, and you can actually buy both at the same time. A lot of the time when you actually purchase a book, it comes up with the books that are eligible, come up with a purchase the audible narration for an extra, you know, three, five, $10 or whatever against the book. So um, Amazon technology and or the, the software that keeps Kindle and Audible synced across several devices is WhisperSync. Um, so you can read the book and switch to the Audible narration seamlessly um, and it's available on the, some electronic books that you purchase, as I just said. However, this is not available on um, Australian devices. So uh, from what the research that I did, I gather that th like this paper white, you can listen to the Audible on the device. You can't do that in Australia. They also block you... So this would mean that I'd have to actually use my mobile phone to listen to the audible narration, which then kind of defeats the purpose of having audible narration with the book on the Kindle because I don't have access to that. And it also kind of defeats having the Kindle for its extended battery life over, say, my mobile phone, which needs to be at least daily charged. Which kind of brings me to my next point. The battery is meant to last approximately six or so-ish weeks but this is really only if you never ever use it. Um, I think it can last up to eight weeks if you literally charge it and just don't touch it after that. If I heavily use it, let's just say two and a half to three hours per day, it lasts me 10 to 12 days, sometimes even less if I use it more. Um, there are no Bluetooth capacities for the Paperwhite uh, in Australia, unlike the US. Kindle accepts uh, nominally, nominally, at least several different formats such as PDF and Word, but due to the ebook's own proprietary ebook format created by Amazon with the extension .azw, um, and it's kind of like a Mobi format, not a Mobi, the other one, um, EPUB format, or oh, similar to that, um, I have found quite a few rejections of books that I had stored. Uh, due to my previous Kin Kobo ownership, I had a substantial book collection and electronic book collection and I could transfer approximately a third of that over to this Kindle. I have found that the screen, you know, could, can be both sens super sensitive, as in highlights, words or passages, super easy, but also is frustratingly so when attempting to turn the page scroll through the Kindle shop or go to a specific uh, folder or page while you're searching for a book. It becomes maddeningly slow during these times so it's almost not responsive when 
you try and search for, search for something and of course we're used to the way that mobile phone touchscreens work now and a lot of the time we I have uh, my laptop is a touchscreen my phone is a touchscreen and they work so much significantly faster than a touchscreen on this Kindle but then every time I'm reading a book it highlights a word or a passage and it just kind of becomes a well can't you just turn the page quicker It would be much more convenient if this could be more responsive in general to the touchscreen, but also not highlight everything in the gust of a wind. It also has a black and white screen, which is super useful for extending the battery life, but not so much with photos or art. It also doesn't accept graphic novel format, which comes with the extension CBC or CBZ, which is kind of another negative for here. I feel I quite enjoy graphic novels. Um, new releases can also, new releases on in the Amazon store, the Kindle store, uh, can actually still be quite expensive. They can be up to $25, $30, which is the same price as a physical book in Australia. So uh, Kindle, um, Unlimited, which is essentially a library that you can borrow and return books from, uh, which can be quite convenient. And often you can get the deals where it costs X amount for three months and then like a monthly fee after that. And they don't really carry a lot of new releases on the Kindle Unlimited. And a lot, you can elect to, if you publish a book on Amazon, you can elect to join the Kindle program like the Kindle Unlimited program so your book is offered this way which can be convenient for people who have this option or, or are self-publishing books and but if you're on Amazon Unlimited to actually kind of read new releases and return them I think you get up to 10 books that you can borrow from Kindle Unlimited at a time but again it doesn't necessarily carry all the new releases which is unlike a normal physical library would so your normal physical library gets new releases and you can go down and you know rent it or hire it or at least go on a wait list to rent or hire it so um, on top of that international authors that are um, on Kindle Unlimited are often only there for a uh, short time so the book we might be on a month or two in Kindle Unlimited and then get out so that can be kind of frustrating for essentially an online library. In addition since Amazon's uh, showing site is active purchase of the uh, American purchases from the American Kindle shop or American or unlimited can be geolocation blocked and you can't actually purchase an American Kindle with audible narration from the American site it will essentially geolock there and this, which is a bit weird because um, uh, Amazon is essentially geolocking literally their own propriety brand which I found super weird because it's not like they are going to have um, issues with copyright being that this is their this is essentially their copyright which seems a bit uh, weird <laughs> to me so but other issues that I've had is that sorting big books on here is actually quite counterintuitive so I obviously preloaded the books that I had already purchased or already owned and uh, this is this has kind of resulted in a cumulative total of about 10 to 11 gigabyte of books that are currently on this machine uh, sorting through them and into folders was a nightmare and took about three months and while it could be easy while sorting them into a folder can be quite easy if you have an author say like Alex Archer some of these are sorted into um, sections Agatha Christie Alastair Reynolds so when you're sorting by author you can select uh, all of the author but sometimes I have folders in here like I have a history folder so all the books that have been written about history or I have uh, you know LGBT lesbian literature fic uh, folder um, on here as well which means I can biography folder there you go there's a biography folder so 
trying to sort through that can be infuriatingly frustrating to do. So that biography folder has 334 books in it and because there are a variety of authors and essentially this sorts it by, you can sort it by author or title but you're not necessarily going to get an obviously an obvious autobiography or biography when you're sorting it that way. So sorting them into folders can be super infuriating and just take so long if you're not sorting them by author. So I've got a cooking one, I've got classics. So I've got quite a few folders in here that just took a long time to get all of the books sorted out into. I think I had over a thousand like 1200 pages of books with like in this setup with the six books per page and yeah so that sorting them into folders makes sense because then genres and collections are actually easier to find and easier to set up and it's just easier to find all the books that I need to with this however it just became crazy irritating to sort through so many books into the folders um so 513 books in history that was one of the biggest folders that i do have in here so that was one of the frustrated frustrations that i had so these are the books at the back that i haven't actually sorted out into the folders yet uh, these are some uh, kind of recent or current books that I'm looking at or purchases or gifts that I've had. So when you, how you know it's a Kindle Unlimited is that it has, uh, it depends if it's going to focus on this at the moment, it has the Kindle Unlimited section at the top. So... <laughs> Now for, I guess, the positives of the Kindle. This is super lightweight and actually is small enough to fit into my pockets and that's super impressive being that I wear clothes that are aimed at women and can be super infuriating with the pocket size. At six inches, it is easy to carry and this is the best collection of books that I can carry and it's also personalized to my taste. I will always have a book in a genre I want to read and if I don't feel like reading what I'm currently reading I can also easily change up the books. So the screen is fully adjustable by brightness and size meaning that the tighter my eyes get the bigger and gentler I can make the tests. The screen is also a matte uh, screen allowing for a glare free clear display even in full sunshine. It provides an offline multilingual disc dictionary that is kind of preloaded onto the machine and access to one of the biggest online library, commercial libraries, as in Kindle Unlimited. Also, I have been able to read an article about great books or the best books of whichever 2020 or 2018 or whatever by um, and go to Kindle and get them. A really great example of this is River of Teeth by Sarah Gailey, uh, which is this book down here. It's a collection of three stories, which is why it's here. It's called American Hippo because it's a collection of three. Um, but the description of the book was that to solve the meat crisis of 1909 by populating Louisiana swamplands with hippos. Um, I obviously found this description super hilarious. And I went to the Kindle store and River of Teeth was on sale for like $3. Um, and the collection of the three stories in this uh, genre were I think like seven ninety eight or something at the time so I purchased the story of three and then when I read the forward it said that this was based on a real life actual plan and it was outlined and or overviewed in the Atavist magazine article American Hippopotamus by John Mulem Mulalem uh, which was part of the Kindle Unlimited program, which is actually this book up here. So I have actually borrowed that from the Kindle Unlimited library so that I could read this and read the retelling of this seemingly, seemingly crazy plan and then you could read the fiction book about that. I may have forgotten the article or the book that this idea came from because it happened months, months ago, but uh, 
now I don't have to. I could actually focus on my graphic novel and coffee book collection so I could actually just go straight to Kindle. I could get them, I could borrow them and then they were on my book to read. So then the next month when I was looking at my Kindle going, what am I going to read? I can go, oh, it was the American Hippo thing. It was this story about and then I recalled it, which I probably wouldn't have if I just went, what was that book that they were talking about? Or what was that funny story that I was laughing about? And so it does give you access to be able to go and do this stuff kind of straight away, or you'll get the book on sale, or you'll get the book for cheap. And it just makes things easier to access when you have it on this type of device. So this whole kind of scenario about the hippopotamus plan for Louisiana swamplands would not have actually happened with if I hadn't owned a Kindle. I now can actually focus on my graphic novel and coffee table collection in physical format and don't have to worry about the fiction or the biography which I actually love to read side of things because I can actually have this on a Kindle. It is exceptionally small, convenient and light, fits into my backpack, fits into my pocket, I can travel with it, it has lifted my book hoarding load considerably in getting this. So this is kind of my review of the Kindle and uh, my positives and negatives with it. Um, I probably wouldn't want to give that up now, so um, it is uh, super useful device so thank you for watching and uh, as usual all links will be down in the description box below including uh, the books that I've mentioned as well as some other ones that I like um, some of them will be in the Kindle Unlimited program some may no longer um, enjoy your morning afternoon or evening depending on where you are in the day and I of course will see you all in the next video bye everyone Hello everybody and welcome back to Rebellious Menstruation. Um, hello everybody. Okay, so that's a bit better. Honestly, it's hello everybody and welcome back to Rebellious Menstruation. I have previously posted a positive review of the Dirt Company. Um, back in December 2019. I'll actually link it up here in the left hand corner for you to check out um, if you so choose to. Uh... Hello everybody and welcome back to Rebellious Menstruation. This is an unboxing video for Love Luna, uh, the period Hello everybody and welcome back to Rebellious Menstruation and just a little um, what's in my bag. This is kind of a day weekend bag type of deal. Um, this is a teal corduroy bag um, that I've got. Of course I have my mobile with me, headphones with me and a jacket for when it cools down in this little front pocket here okay i've got bus pass this looks probably the same as a lot of other videos because it's been the same id and medicare card um this is my lip balm um this is a dr bonner lip balm and this is hand sanitizer by thank you it's grapefruit um yep so that's in the front pocket okay oh i'm gonna drop my in the main pocket comb wide tooth comb this here um in my backpack that i take to work is my bigger cutlery set i don't need a particularly big cutlery set at the moment um this just has oh, if I can get any of it out. A little spoon, uh, bamboo splay thing that came with the set, a uh, little fork and a little um, steel straw. Okay. 
today. So everything's starting to fall over today and it's just super frustrating. Um, okay, water bottle. This is my clean canteen double walled one. It's held up pretty well. Awesome colour. Um, this again is my stasher bag in case I need to get anything. Um, inside the stasher bag, uh, lime and crack packet, chickpea bites, mentos, a protein ball and a container of a mix of mints. Um, usually these can roam three free in my bag, they don't need to be in here. But the stasher bag just contains them in case I because I carry the stasher bag for when I need it. Um, Kindle. Obviously take your Kindle. I take my Kindle everywhere. Um, this is a scarf. It's a Wonder Woman scarf. Um, that's what else. Oh, let's do it this way maybe. Don't think there's much in here. Um, I've actually got my period at the moment. So um, this is just contains um, three Venus pads, a model body and a Love Luna pair of underwear um, for when I need to change. Um, I have my Frank Green coffee cup for when I get coffee. And I have my phone charger and I have my We Might Be Tiny silicon straw. So not much for today. I don't need a particular lot for going out. Um, but that is um, what is in my current kind of go out with me day bag. Um, this is going to be a short video, obviously. Um, thank you for watching. Um, I'll try and put all the links down below. Other than that, thank you for watching. Enjoy your morning, afternoon or evening, depending on where you are in the day. And I will catch up with you all in the next video. Bye, everyone. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Rebellious Menstruation. This is uh, a What a War this month. Uh, Hello everybody and welcome back to Rebellious Menstruation. This is an unboxing video of Love Luna's reusable pads and these are sold at online on their website. They are also sold via re retailers such as Woolworths and Big W in Australia so you are able to access them by uh, going to a local shop as well which is actually quite a good thing because quite often pads are cloth pads particularly are generally sold online so part of the love luna ethos is protection period protection that is also sustainable reusable and affordable so these this liner was seven dollars this regular was i think ten dollars and then this super was 13. so these three not only are they available and accessible but they are also generally co they cost well at least this one here the liner will cost basically the same as a packet of pads or a packet of tampons while that doesn't on the surface sound like um, necessarily an affordable swap they are a third of the price that will the their love lunar's period underwear is a third of the price of moddy bodies um, so this is kind of why um, the founders of love lunar uh, started this company was because they in, in, in about 2017 was to actually have affordable reusable period protection uh, which is how they founded their first kind of line lovely period underwear which I've done both an unboxing of and a review of both of which I'll link up on the left hand side of this unboxing so the created it so they wanted to create an affordable sustainable and comfortable change 
that is also available in shops. So, um, and as I said, I, I'm pretty sure that's part of their contract is that they have a contract with Woolworths and Woolworths and Big W um, here have like a, well, they're at least maybe owned by the same parent company. So, even though you can also uh, purchase them with your, purchase them online from their website. So, this is the reusable panty liner. Um, it says wash and wear on the front and protection doesn't have to cost the earth. And the bottom of the box is what it is made out of. It doesn't want to focus on what it is made out of. Here, we'll see if we can get maybe one of these to focus on because they're all made out of the same. No, it just doesn't want to focus on it. Maybe I need to turn the auto focus off. So the composition is the inner layer 100% cotton, the middle layers cotton and poly terry, and the outer layer 100% cotton, exclusive of trims because it has a polyester trim. So um, maybe this maybe will work. Who knows? Because sometimes that will work. No, it's just super determined not to focus today. Hello everybody and welcome back to Rebellious Menstruation. This is an unboxing video of Love Luna's reusable pads. And these are sold at online on their website. They are also sold via re retailers such as Woolworths and Big W in Australia. So you are able to access them by uh, going to a local shop as well, which is actually quite a good thing because quite often pads, are, cloth pads particularly, are generally sold online. So part of the Love Luna ethos is protection period protection that is also sustainable, reusable, and affordable. So these, this liner was $7. This regular was, I think, $10. And then this super was 13 so these three, not only are they available and accessible, but they are also generally, co they cost, well at least this one here, the liner will cost basically the same as a packet of pads or a packet of tampons. While that doesn't on the surface sound like um, necessarily an affordable swap, they are a third of the price that well, the, their Love Lunar's period underwear is a third of the price of Modi Bodies. Um, so, this is kind of why um, the founders of Love Lunar uh, started this company was because they in, in, in about 2017 was to actually have affordable reusable period protection uh, which is how they founded their first kind of line loveliness period underwear which i've done both an unboxing of and a review of both of which i'll link up on the left hand side of this unboxing so they created it so they wanted to create an affordable sustainable and comfortable change that is also available in shops so um, and as i said i i'm pretty sure that's part of their contract is that they have a contract with woolworths and woolworths and big w um here have like a well they're at least maybe owned by the same parent company so even though you can also uh purchase them with your purchase them online from their website so this is the reusable panty liner. Um, it says wash and wear on the front and protection doesn't have to cost the earth. And the bottom of the box 
is what it is made out of. It doesn't want to focus on what it is made out of. Here, we'll see if we can get maybe one of these to focus on because they're all made out of the same. No, it just doesn't want to focus on it. Maybe I need to turn the auto focus off. So the composition is the inner layer 100% cotton, the middle layers cotton and poly terry, and the outer layer 100% cotton, exclusive of trims because it has a polyester trim. So um, maybe this maybe will work. Who knows? Because sometimes that will work. No, it's just super determined not to focus today.